For those of you who have read my other stories and asked if there was more and received cryptic answers from me, I want to apologize for being dishonest. I said several times in the comments that nothing really happened after footsteps, but that wasn't true. The events of the following story weren't locked away in the recesses of my mind. I've always remembered them. It wasn't until I remembered balloons and spoke with my mother about the following events that I realised how intertwined this story was with everything else. But I originally hadn't really planned on sharing this anyway. My desire to withhold this memory was due mostly to the fact that I don't think I showed good judgement in it. I also wanted consent from another person to tell it, so as not to misrepresent what transpired. I didn't expect there to be a lot of interest in my other stories, so I never thought I'd really get pressed for more details, and I would have been happy to keep this to myself for the rest of my life. I haven't been able to reach the other party, but I would feel disingenuous withholding this story from those who wanted more information now that I've spoken with my mother and another connecting line has been drawn. What follows is as accurate a recollection as I could manage, and I apologize for the length. I spent the summer before my first year of elementary school learning how to climb trees. There was one particular pine tree right outside my house that seemed almost designed for me. It had branches that were so low I could easily grab them without a boost, and for the first couple of days after I first learned how to pull myself up, I would just sit on the lowest branch, dangling my feet. The tree was outside our back fence and was easily visible from the kitchen window which was just above the sink. Before too long, my mother and I developed a routine where I would go and play on the tree when she washed the dishes because she could easily see me while she did other things. As the summer passed, my abilities grew and before too long I was climbing fairly high. As the tree got taller, its branches not only got thinner but more widely spaced. I eventually reached a point where I couldn't actually climb any higher, so the game had to change. I began to concentrate on speed, and in the end I'd reach my highest branch in 25 seconds. I got too confident one afternoon and tried to step from a branch before I'd firmly grasped the next one. I fell about 20 feet and broke my arm really bad in two places. My mum was running towards me yelling and I remember her sounding like she was underwater. I don't remember what she said but I do remember being surprised by just how white my bone was. I was going to start kindergarten with a cast and wouldn't even have any friends to sign it. My mum must have felt terrible because the day before I started school she brought home a kitten. He was just a baby and was striped with tan and white. As soon as she put him down, he crawled into an empty case of soda that was sitting on the floor. I named him Boxes. Boxes was only an outside cat when he escaped. My mum had him declawed so he wouldn't destroy the furniture, so as a result, we did our best to keep him inside. He'd get out every now and then, and we'd find him somewhere in the backyard chasing some kind of bug or lizard, though he could hardly ever catch one because he had no front claws. He was pretty evasive, but we'd always catch him and carry him back inside. He'd scramble to look over my shoulder. I told my mum that it was because he was planning his strategy for next time. Once inside, we'd give him some tuna fish, and he came to learn what the sound of the can opener might signal. He'd come running whenever he heard it. This conditioning came in handy later because towards the end of our time in that house, boxes would get out much more often and would run under the house into the crawl space where neither of us wanted to follow because it was cramped and probably crawling with bugs and rodents. Ingeniously, my mom thought to hook the can opener to an extension cord out back and run it right outside the hole that Boxes had gone through. Eventually, he would emerge with his loud meows and looking excited by the sound and then horrified at how we could run such a cruel ruse on him. A can opener with no tuna made no sense to Boxes. 
The last time he escaped under the house was actually our last day in it. My mom had put the house on the market and we began packing our things. We didn't have much and we stretched the packing out a while. So I'd already packed up all my clothes at my mom's request. My mom could tell I was really sad about moving and wanted the transition to be smooth for me. And I guess she thought that having my clothes in the box would reinforce the idea that we were moving. But things wouldn't change that much. When boxes got out as we were loading some things into the moving van, my mom cursed because she had already packed the can opener and wasn't sure where it was. I pretended to go look for it so I wouldn't have to go under the house, and my mom, probably completely aware of my little scam, moved one of the panels and crawled in. She came out with boxes pretty quickly and she seemed pretty unnerved, which made me feel even better about getting out of it. My mom made some phone calls while I packed a little more and... She came into my room and told me that she had spoken to the realtor and we were going to start moving into the other house that day. She said it like it was excellent news, but I had thought we had more time in this house. She originally said that we weren't moving until the end of the week, and it was only Tuesday. What's more, we weren't completely finished packing, but my mom said sometimes it was just easier to replace things than pack them and haul them over the city. I didn't even get to grab the rest of my box of clothes. I asked if I could call Josh to say bye, but she said that we could just call him from our new house. We left in the moving van. I managed to stay in touch with Josh for years, which is surprising since we no longer went to the same school. Our parents weren't close friends, but they knew that we were, and so they would accommodate our desire to see one another by driving us back and forth for sleepovers, sometimes every weekend. For Christmas one year, our parents even pulled their money and got us some really nice walkie-talkies that were advertised to work across a range that extended past the distance between our houses. They also had batteries that could last for days if the walkie-talkie was on but not used. They would only occasionally work well enough that we could talk from across the city, but when we stayed over, we used them around the house, talking in mock radio speak that we had taken from movies. And they worked great for that. Thanks to our parents, we were still friends when we were 10. One weekend, I was staying over at Josh's and my mom called me to say goodnight. She was still pretty watchful even when she couldn't actually watch me, but I'd gotten so used to it that I didn't even notice, even if Josh did. She sounded upset. Boxes was missing. This must have been a Saturday night because I'd spent the night at Josh's the previous night and was going to go home the next day because we had school on Monday. Boxes had been missing since Friday afternoon. I gathered that she'd not seen him since returning home after dropping me off. She must have decided to tell me he was missing because if he didn't come home before I did I would have been devastated at not only his absence but how she could have kept it from me. She told me not to worry. He'll come back. He always does. But, boxes didn't come back. Three weekends later, I stayed at Josh's again. I was still upset about boxes, but my mom told me that there had been many times when pets had disappeared from homes for weeks or even months, only to return on their own. She said they always knew where home was and would not, and would always try to get back. I was explaining this to Josh when a thought hit me so hard I interrupted my own sentence to say it aloud. What if Boxes thought of the wrong home? Josh was confused. What? He lives with you. He knows where his home is. But he grew up somewhere else, Josh. He was raised in my old house a couple of neighborhoods away. Maybe he still thinks that place is home, like I do. Oh, I get it. Well, that'd be great. Well, I'll tell my dad tomorrow and he'll take us over so we can look. Nah, man, he won't. My mom said that we couldn't ever go back to that place because the new owners wouldn't want to be bothered. She said that she told your mom and dad the same thing. Josh persisted. Okay then, we'll just go exploring tomorrow and make our way to your old house. No, if we get spotted, your dad will find out and then my mom will find out. We just have to go there ourselves and we have to go there tonight. It didn't take much convincing to get Josh on board since he was usually the one to come up with ideas like this but we'd never snuck out of his house before. It actually turned out to be incredibly easy. 
The window in his room opened to the backyard and he had a latched wooden fence that wasn't locked. After those two minor hurdles, we slipped off into the night, flashlights and walkie-talkies in hand. There were two ways to get from Josh's house to my old house. We could walk on the street and make all the turns, or go through the woods, which would take about half the time. It would have taken us about two hours to walk there, taking the street, but I suggested we go that way anyway. I told him it was because I didn't want to get lost. Josh refused and said that if we're seen, they might recognize him and tell his dad. He threatened to go home if we didn't just take the shortcut, and I accepted it because I didn't want to go by myself. Josh didn't know about the last time I walked through those woods at night. The woods seemed much less creepy with a friend and a flashlight, and we were making pretty good time. I wasn't entirely sure where we were, but Josh seemed confident enough, and that bolstered my morale. We passed through a particularly thick patch of tangled trees when the strap on my walkie-talkie got caught in a branch. Josh had the flashlight, and so I was struggling to get the walkie free when I heard Josh say, Hey man, wanna go for a swim? I looked over to where he was shining the flashlight, though I closed my eyes as I did, because I now knew where we were. He was pointing at the pool float. This was where I'd woken up in the woods all those years ago. I felt a lump in my throat and the sting of fresh tears in my eyes as I continued to struggle with the walkie. Frustrated, I yanked on it hard enough to break it, and I turned and walked to Josh, who had laid down on the pool float in a mock sunbathing pose. As I walked towards him, I stumbled and nearly fell into a fairly large hole that was sitting in the middle of the small clearing. But I regained my balance and stopped right at its edge. It was deep. I was surprised by the size of the hole, but more surprised by the fact that I don't remember it. I realized it must not have been there that night because it was in the same spot where I had awoken. I put it out of my mind and turned to Josh. Quit messing around, man. You saw I was stuck over there, and you were just laying here, joking around on this float? I punctuated the sentence with a kick to the exposed part of the float. A screeching rose from it. Josh's smile inverted. He suddenly looked terrified as he was struggling to get off the float but he couldn't in a quick manner due to the awkward way he'd been laying on it. Each time he would fall back on the float, the screeching would intensify. I wanted to help Josh, but I couldn't move any closer. My legs wouldn't cooperate. I hated these woods. I picked up the flashlight they had thrown in his thrashing and shined it on the float, not knowing what to expect. Finally, Josh got off the float and rushed next to me, looking at where I was shining the light. Suddenly, there it was. It was a rat. I started laughing nervously, and we both watched the rat run into the woods, taking the screeches with it. Josh lightly punched me in the arm, the smile slowly returning to his face, and we continued walking. We quickened our pace and made it out of the woods faster than we thought we would, and we found ourselves back in my old neighborhood. The last time I had rounded the bend ahead, I had seen my house fully illuminated, and all the memories of what transpired came flooding back. I felt a skipping in my heart as we were finally turning the corner and about to face the full view of my house, remembering last time how incandescent it was. But this time all the lights were off. From a distance, I could see my old climbing tree, and as my mind traced the steps of casualty backward, I realized that I wouldn't be back here this night if the tree hadn't grown. And I was briefly in awe of how all events were like that. As we got closer, I could see that the lawn looked terrible. I couldn't even guess when it had last been mowed. One of the shutters had partially broken loose and was rocking back and forth in the breeze, and overall the house just looked dirty. I was sad to see my old home in such a state of disrepair. Why would my mum care if we bothered the new owners if they cared so little about where they lived? And then I realised... There were no new owners. The house was abandoned, though it looked simply forsaken. Why would my mom lie to me about our house having new people in it? But I thought that this was actually a good thing. It would be easier to look around for boxes if we didn't have to worry about being spotted by the new family. This would make it much quicker. 
Josh interrupted my thoughts as we walked through the gate and up to the house itself. Your old house sucks, dude. Shut up, Josh. Even like this, it's nicer than your house. Hey, man. Okay, okay. I think Boxes is probably under the house. One of us has to go under and look, but the other should stay next to the opening, in case he comes running out. Are you serious? There's no way I'm going under there. It's your cat, man. You can do it. Look, I'll game you for it. Unless you're too scared. I said, holding my fist over my turned up palm. Fine, we'll go and shoot. Not on three. It's rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Not one, two, three. I know how to play the game, Josh. You're the one who always messes up. It's two out of three. I lost. I wiggled loose the panel that my mum would always move when she had to crawl under there for boxes. She only had to do it a couple of times since the can opener trick usually worked, but when she had to do it, she hated it. Especially that last time. And as I looked into the darkness of the crawl space, I had a greater appreciation of why. Before we moved, she said that it was actually better that boxes ran under here, despite how hard it could be to get him out. It was less dangerous than him jumping over the fence and running around the neighborhood. All that was true, but I was still dreading doing this. I grabbed the flashlight, the walkie, and began to crawl in. A powerful smell overtook me. It smelled like death. I turned on my walkie. Josh, are you there? This is Macho Man. Come back. Josh, cut it out. There's something wrong down here. What do you mean? It stinks. It smells like something died. Is it boxes? I really hope not. I set down the walkie and moved the flashlight around as I crawled forward. Looking through the hole from the outside, you could see all the way back with the right lighting. But you had to be inside to see around the support blocks that held the house up. I'd say that there was about 40% of the area that you couldn't see unless you were actually in the crawl space, but even inside I discovered that I could only see directly where the flashlight was pointing. I realized that this would make scouting around the place much more difficult. As I moved forward, the smell intensified. The fear was growing in me that boxes had come here and something had happened to them. I shined the flashlight around but couldn't see much of anything. I wrapped my fingers around a support block and pulled myself forward and as I did that, I felt something that made my hand recoil. Fur. My heart sank as I prepared myself emotionally for what I was about to see. I crawled slowly so that I could prolong what I knew was coming and I inched my eyes and the flashlight past the block to see what was on the other side. I staggered back in horror. Jesus Christ! and escaped my trembling mouth. It was a hideous and twisted creature, badly decomposed. Its skin had rotted away on its face, and teeth appeared to be enormous. And the smell was unbearable. What is it? Are you okay? Is it boxes? I reached for the walkie. No. No, it's not boxes. Well, what the hell is it then? I don't know. I shined the light on it again, and looked at it with less fear in my vision. I chuckled. <laughs> it's a raccoon. Well, keep looking. I'm going to go into the house and see if you might have made it in there somehow. What? No, Josh, don't go in there. What if Boxes is down here and runs out? He can't. I put the board back. I looked and saw you was telling the truth. Why'd you do that? Don't worry, man. You can move it easy. This makes much more sense. If Boxes ran out and I missed him, then he'd be gone. If he's down there, then grab him tight and I'll come move the board. And if he's not there, you can move it yourself while I look in the house. Some of his points were good, and I doubted he'd be able to get in anyway. Okay, but be careful, and don't touch anything. There's a bunch of my old clothes still in boxes in my room. You can look in there and see if you crawled into one. Make sure you bring your walkie. Roger that, good buddy. I realized that it would be pitch black in there. The power would have been turned off since no one was paying the bill. With any luck, he'd be able to see from the streetlights that might cast some light inside. Otherwise, I'm not sure what he'd do. Before too long, I heard footsteps right over my head and felt old dirt raining down on me. Josh, is that you? Breaker, Breaker, this is Macho Man coming back to the Big Tangle Foxtrot. 
The eagle has landed. Watch your 20, Princess Jasmine. Over. Asshole. Watch your man. My 20 is in your bathroom looking at your stash of magazines. Looks like you got a thing for dudes' butts. What's the report on that? Over. I could hear him laughing without the walkie and I started laughing too. I heard the footsteps fade away a little. He was on his way to my room. Man, it's dark in here. Hey, are you sure you had that box of clothes in here? I don't see any. Yeah, there should be a couple of boxes in front of the closets. There aren't any boxes in here. Let me check if you maybe put the boxes in the closet before you left. I started thinking that maybe my mum had come back and gotten the clothes and just gave them away because I would outgrown a lot of them. But I remembered leaving boxes there. I didn't even have time to close up the last one before we left. While I was waiting for Josh to tell me what he found, I kicked out my leg, which started falling asleep because of the position I was in. And it hit something. I looked back and saw something really strange. There was a blanket, and all around it were bowls. I crawled a little closer to it. The blanket smelled moldy, and most of the bowls were empty, but one had something that I recognized in it. Cat food. It was a different kind than we gave to boxes, but I suddenly understood. My mom had set up a little place for boxes to encourage him to come here instead of running around the neighborhood. Now that made a lot of sense, and it seemed even more likely that boxes would come back to this place. Ha, <laughs> that's so cool, mom, I thought. I found your clothes. Oh, cool. Where were the boxes? Like I said, there are no boxes. Your clothes are in your closet. They're hanging up. I felt a chill. This is impossible. I'd packed all my clothes. Even though we weren't supposed to move for another two weeks when we left, I remember packing them and thinking that it would be stupid for me to have to get clothes out of the box and put them back in. I had packed them, but someone had hung them back up. Why though? Josh needed to get out of there. That can't be right, Josh. They're supposed to be in boxes. Come on, stop messing around and just come back outside. No joke, man. I'm looking at them. Maybe you just thought that you'd left them. Huh. <laughs> wow. You sure do like to look at yourself, don't you? What? What do you mean? Your walls, man. They're covered in Polaroids of yourself. There's hundreds of them. Would you hire someone to- Silence. I checked my walkie to see if it had switched off somehow. It was fine. I could hear footsteps, but I couldn't really tell exactly where Josh was going. I waited for Josh to finish his sentence, thinking that his finger just slipped off the button, but he didn't continue. He seemed to be stomping around the house now. I was just about to radio him when he came back. There's someone in the house. His voice was hushed and broken. I could he hear. I could hear he was on the verge of tears. I wanted to respond, but how loud was his walkie turned up? What if the other person heard it? I said nothing and just waited and listened. What I heard were footsteps. Heavy, dragging footsteps. And then a loud thud. Oh god. Josh. He had found something. I was sure of it. This person had found him and was hurting him. I broke out in tears. He was my only friend next to boxes. And then I realized. What if Josh told him I was under here? What could I possibly do? As I struggled to compose myself, I thankfully heard Josh's voice through the walkie. He's got something, man. It's a big bag. He just threw it on the floor and... Oh god, man. The bag. I think it just moved. I was paralyzed. I wanted to run home. I wanted to save Josh. I wanted to go for help. I wanted so many things, but I just lay there, frozen. As I lay unable to move, my eyes focused on the corner of the house that was right under my room. I moved the flashlight. My breath hitched at what I saw. Animals! Dozens of them. All of them dead. They lay in piles all around the perimeter of the crawl space. Could boxes be among these corpses? Was this what the cat food was for? Seeing this broke my shock as I knew I had to get out of there, and I scrambled to the board. I pushed on it, but it wouldn't budge. I couldn't move it because it was wedged in there, and I couldn't get my fingers around it since the edges were outside. I was trapped. God damn you, Josh. 
I whispered to myself. I could feel thunderous footsteps above me. The house was shaking. I heard Josh scream and it was matched by another scream that wasn't full of fear. As I continued pushing, I felt the board move, but I knew it wasn't me who was moving it. I could hear footsteps above me and in front of me, and shouting and screaming filled the brief silences between the footsteps. I moved back and held my walkie ready to try and defend myself, and the board was thrown to the side, and an arm shot in and grabbed me. Let's go, man, now. It was Josh. Thank God. I scrambled out of the opening, holding the flashlight and the walkie. When we got to the fence, we both jumped it, but Josh's walkie fell. He reached for it, but I told him to forget it. We had to move. Behind us, I could hear yelling. Though they weren't words, only sounds. And we, perhaps foolishly, ran for the woods to get back to Josh's quicker. It'd be somewhat harder to follow. The whole way, though, the whole way through the woods, Josh kept yelling. My picture? He just took my picture! But I knew this man already had Josh's picture from all those years ago at the ditch. I suppose Josh still thought those mechanical sounds were from a robot. We made it back to Josh's house and back into his room before his parents woke up. I asked him about the big bag and if it really moved, and he said he couldn't be sure. He kept apologizing about dropping the walkie at the house, but obviously that wasn't a big deal. We didn't, we didn't go to sleep and sat peering out the window waiting for him. I went home later that day, as it was about 3am already. I told my mum the basics of the story a couple of days ago. She broke down and was furious about the danger I put myself in. I asked her why she made all those things up about bothering the new owners to stop me from going. Why did she think the house was so dangerous? She became irate and hysterical, but she answered my question. She grabbed my hand and squeezed it harder than I thought her capable of, and locked her eyes to mine, whispering as if she was afraid of being overheard. Because I never put any fucking blankets or bowls under the house for boxes. You weren't the only one to find them. I felt dizzy. I understood so much now. I understood why she had looked so uneasy after she brought boxes out from under the house on our last day there. She found more than spiders or a rat's nest that day. I understood why we left almost two weeks early. I understood why she tried to stop me from going back. She knew. She knew he made his home under ours, and she kept it from me. I left without saying another word, and didn't finish the story for her. But I want to finish it here. For you. I got home from Josh's that day and threw my stuff on the floor, and scattered everywhere. I didn't care, I just wanted to sleep. I woke up around 9pm to the sound of boxes meowing. My heart leapt. He'd finally come home. I was a little sick about the fact that if I just waited a day, none of the previous night's events would have happened, and I'd have boxes anyway. But it didn't matter. He was back. I got off my bed and called for him, looking around to catch a glint of light of his eyes. The crying continued and I followed it. It was coming from under the bed. I laughed a little, thinking I had just crawled under a house looking for him, and how this was so much better. His meows were being muffled by a shirt, so I flung it aside and smiled, yelling, Welcome home, boxes! His cries were coming from my walkie-talkie. Boxes never came home.